I'm just gonna do a very, very quick, I'm sorry, I'm gonna ask you to do something and think for one second. I know this is a lot of information and frankly, I, when I see it, it's very overwhelming. I mean, both in terms of the promise, um, but also when I look at Raj, no offense, your mobility data sort of depresses me considerably. So, um, <laughs> There are obviously very good news. Um, there, there is some very good news coming out of some of the evidence and what we think we can build. I want a show of hands. And this is a simple question. How many of you have used Yelp in the past month to find a restaurant? I don't believe it's that low, come on. <laughs> okay. All right, how many of you surfed Amazon to shop online on Black Friday or Cyber Monday? Okay. So just think about how easy it is to go on Yelp or you know, find the best sushi place nearby or to log on to Amazon to find movies or music or makeup. But there isn't an Amazon that aggregates and helps you purchase healthcare, student loans or legal assistance. And there's not a Yelp for the highest rated childcare, emergency shelter or job training program within a 10 mile radius. Why haven't we applied our best ideas, our best tools, to the things that should matter most? We've just heard a lot of startling evidence um, and sobering evidence from Raj and David and Mark. Um, and the headlines of this really, and they're gonna kill me for summing it up so simply, and I'm sure I'm getting it off, but um, I can go work at Harvard. Uh, the new data shows <laughs> that economic mobility is unacceptably low and really plummeting. We're on a 50 year plummet here or more. Um, and the other thing that is good about the flip side of this is that for the first time in history, we really are in a different moment. We are in a moment where we can take these bits of data and paint a whole new national picture. We can sort of, we can be the pointillists of our generation. How can you take these little bits and create a whole new picture of how you see the world and how we organize it. For the first time, I actually think in many ways we can do something about poverty at scale. And this is more critical today than ever before. So there's gonna be one last question, and I swear to God I'm not gonna ask you another question, but this is the come to Jesus moment. Um, how many of you show of hands, regardless of party, because we have quite a few folks from all sides of the aisle here today, are, for lack of a better term, freaked out about what's occurring across the nation right now. I'm glad you guys aren't worried, because you, you present the data that worried me. So if you're, if you're calm, I'm good, Raj. <laughs> um, now, I won't put you on the spot with hands, um, but I do want you to take just like 15 seconds because this, at the end of the day, is the heart of why we're all here. I mean, we, you know, all this backdrop is really important. Why we're here is um, that many of you are doing some of the most important work, and we're gonna be hearing from lightning rounds and stuff of some of the most exciting examples of work that's going out in the field. Um, but I want you to take 10 seconds and just reflect on what you are personally doing about it and what more you think you can do. So if there ever was a wake up call about the depth of divisions that can be sowed by lack of mobility in a country, I think this last election season was it. And as Tim O'Reilly put it, being a historian, not a technologist, civilizations have fallen many times in ways that were formerly unthinkable. But as Jim mentioned this morning, and as the What Works panel and Dave Grusky and Mark Duggan have all sort of shown, is a major consequence of this is that many important programs, including the ACA, albeit imperfect, but impactful, many of these very, very critical national anti-poverty programs could be facing dismantlement. And decisions could be driven, and probably will be to some extent, 
to the states and localities that are not yet positioned with this sort of mega data infrastructure um, that, or the capacity as Carolyn West Whistler referred to, that can absorb this money and these responsibilities at the blistering pace. I also think there's a little bit of a ray of hope in this. If you think about the one thing that there's really been bipartisan agreement on in the last 10 years, and there hasn't been a lot, it's one that there has been a movement that privileges actionable data over ideology. Or uh, Jim Shelton and I had just had a piece came out in SSIR about two hours ago, which was good timing, which is called Facts Over Factions. Something we'll be discussing a lot in the next day and a half. To make good decisions, however, we need good roadmaps, so we have to build the infrastructure. Now, if you feel like poverty and immobility are an overwhelming problem, you're obviously not alone. Um, it's a problem of very big numbers. And to be extremely simplistic about it, the one thing technology does really well in a way that we've never been able to do before is take on really big numbers. We can study the data that Raj and David and Mark and others around the country are accessing and better understand the trend lines. We can use it and balance it out with other sources to cover gaps and biases, to build the infrastructure to measure outcomes, design programs, target interventions that do the most good for the most people at the right time. And most importantly, I think actually we can scale up to some of Jim's work, Jim Shelton's work on big bets. What we already know works. In short, we can sort of take the best lessons of the dot-com world and apply them to dot-gov um, and dot-org. For example, if I want to shop on Amazon or if I think about buying a pair of shoes, this happens to me all the time, it drives me nuts, um, I get reminders, alternatives, nudges, like every time I open my phone. And for some reason, they know what kind of shoe I want or if I want purple or, they seem to know, frankly, when my page tech comes in, because I get a lot more nudges about buying things that I looked at before, exactly at the time that my paycheck hits the bank. So if I can be prompted to buy my next pair of shoes ad nauseum, why can't we prompt first generation college students to fill out their financial aid forms on time? Because we know that's a big boost to whether or not they graduate or go to school. To see their advisors to show up in class. Or what about the hundreds of the thousands of low-income, high-performing youth who don't even go to college? Why aren't we mining the data to find them? We know where they are. And giving them the support they need to apply. As they say, timing is everything. So you might think that nudges and per for purchases and things like that, it's easier to get me to buy a pair of shoes, um, which my husband would agree with. But um, in general, you might think that that's an easier thing to do than to prompt low-income students to apply to college. But actually, the stats on some of this aren't so clear. What we know is that um, remarkably small interventions can make remarkably big differences if they're timed right. And yet, as a nation, we're doing very little about it. If you zoom out from the single college student who needs to apply to helps getting through school or the mother who needs to yelp for childcare in her neighborhood and, and doesn't have access to that. And think about the big data infrastructure, we can actually build and deploy tools that help not just a handful of individuals but tens of millions. And it's really for the first time. And again, at the end of the day, this is a problem of scale and technology does scale best. Now, as my friend Mauricio Lim Miller, who many of you may know, will remind you tomorrow, uh, it doesn't have to be just about telling communities what they need or where to find it. It can be about empowering communities to craft their own solutions to the problems. Tech solutions can be both outsourced and crowdsourced. There's a real empowerment angle here. When I landed at Stanford a year ago, having run one of the nation's largest anti-poverty initiatives for a decade, it struck me there was a huge opportunity here in the Valley to bring these ideas forward that wasn't really being actively pursued. And indeed, much of the point of this conference is to show and to share the efforts we've made in our respective fields and figure out how to accelerate them. We haven't had so far is a place to actually come together and bring the brilliant academics and the incredible community leaders and the fabulous education advocates and the philanthropists 
and really talk about what our ideas are, what's working, and how we actually move forward. We haven't, for lack of a better term, built our innovation accelerator in the US to combat poverty. And that, to some extent, in a, and honestly in a humble way, is, is what we hope to do with the lab. We really hope to serve as a repository and connector, sort of a catalyst, across the government, not-for-profit, academic, and philanthropic spectra to figure out what the best ideas are, share them with you all, because this is about building an innovation network, not about pushing out innovation from one place, um, and figure out how we can use technology and big data to reduce poverty. We also hope that the lab can fill in gaps where they exist, harness the talents of Stanford, the bod student body and the faculty, the know-how of the industry around us to incubate and adapt new technologies and applications. So we don't aim to do this because it's fun. It's actually very, very hard work. We aim to use technology in this way because what technology has done for the past 15 years is what no single anti-poverty program has achieved across the board yet. And I say yet. Really breaking down the barriers to success for tens of millions of Americans in need. Poverty and immobility is clearly a huge problem in the 21st century. It is clearly a growing problem. And it's time that we actually get serious about designing 21st century solutions. So this may sound like an ambitious idea, but the scope and scale of the national tragedy that we're facing us calls for nothing less. We're not under any illusions that this is something we can do on our own, and we really assume that we'll only be a small part of the solution. But with the help of you all in the room and the help of people like you, um, we can launch a whole new sort of innovation network, one that takes the best of philanthropy, big data, community know-how, and technology to rethink how we fight poverty together. If we're properly situated and we're working together, we can accomplish what now may seem impossible. One of the world's first great technologists, you may not think of him as such, was Archimedes. And Archimedes had this famous set of laws, a book called The Law of the Lever, which was, of course, all about leverage. To sum it up, he said, give me the right place to stand and whom to stand with, and I will move the earth. Thank you. <laughs>